that, just in that vein of thanks, just briefly, I want to thank uh, Andrew Hughes and Andrew Tran for bringing us the word the last few weeks. Been a real blessing to me, uh, both in not having to prepare, but also in what you shared with us. Um, I think you blessed us by what you brought from God's table to us. So thank you very much. Um, but before we go on, let's pray, shall we? Father God, we ask in so much need of your spirit. We're in so much need of you. Father, we come, we bow our knee before you right now. We come and we ask that you would bless us with your word, that you would speak into our minds, into our hearts, to our soul, that you would uh, do what you came, say you would do. Holy Spirit, come and take God's word. Amen. Today, today we are constrained, yeah? We're constrained today because today is Palm Sunday, the beginning of Jesus' last week before the cross. And now I have to say something about something that you all know something about, yeah? And so I'm constrained. It must be today about Palm Sunday, yes? It would not do to speak about something else. When I was growing up in a Catholic church, Palm Sunday was a big thing. It's a big thing. There were palm branches, real ones, waved about. A significant event. A parade sometimes there would be. I have vague recollections of a donkey, but nobody riding on it. But... It was a big thing. Palm Sunday also, I think, was the first sermon I ever preached was on Palm Sunday. I'm going to tell you that it was very, very long and very, very boring. I pray that I don't repeat that to you today. Interestingly, Palm Sunday is an event that's recollected by all four of our Gospel writers. This can't be said for all of Jesus' ministry, yeah? So it's, it's something that was of striking importance to them. Uh, it is an event that is really important as we lead up to Jesus' death and resurrection. We're going to read from Luke's Gospel, and we're going to focus today especially on those bits that are unique in his account. So if you'd rather read your own Bible and not read from the screen, it's Luke 19, verses 28 to 48. After this, after, oh, sorry, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put, it, they put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, 
He wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognise the time of God's coming to you. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests and teachers of the law and leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it, because all the people hung on his words. Dramatic account here. Somebody said to me that I should shave my beard and it would help with the microphone. I don't want to shave my beard. Much can be said about Jesus coming into Jerusalem on a donkey, down the slopes of the Mount of Olives, through the Kidron Valley, then up into the city and finally into the temple. There's a whole lot of prophecy, a whole lot of Old Testament and cultural messianic hope rolled into that event. That a lot can be said about Jesus driving from the temple, those who uh, changed money and those who were selling various goods to help with the worship. There's much that could be said about those things. But other gospel writers account for that perhaps better than Luke does. But Luke has a piece that only he under special inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has included in his account. In his research about the life and times of Jesus, this small piece finds its way into his gospel and not into others. That piece happens as Jesus is nearing Jerusalem. The disciples that began their spontaneous praise of Jesus as their Messiah had swelled to include lots and lots of people, a crowd, all of whom the Pharisees described as Jesus' disciples. Well, normally, we would think of a disciple as one who carried out the teaching of their master, a follower. Here it seems loosely applied to anyone who would get on the Jesus bandwagon. Perhaps we could describe them as fans of Jesus. Either way, were the fans or followers, the Pharisees recognised their volume and their danger. But if they didn't praise Jesus, Jesus says, even the rocks would. As Jesus approaches the city down the slopes of the Mount of Olives and sees laid out before him the whole city, dominated by the temple, the city which God had said he chose for his name to dwell in, Jesus weeps. This is not a single tear that escapes the corner of Jesus' eye and rolls down his cheek. Some cinematographer's great delight here. Rather, his weeping, while controlled, is far deeper, more bitter than that. It's an expression of a deep emotion that reflects the compassion and love Jesus bears for the city in his soul. This isn't the first time Jesus has expressed such compassion for Jerusalem. Earlier in Luke's Gospel, Jesus says this, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left desolate, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that day, of course, is this one. It is Palm Sunday when they, they say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus loves this city. 
Some suggest that Jesus weeps because the city rejects him. Or because it would be the place where he uh, meets death on a cross. I think Jesus weeps because of those things. But I think Jesus weeps because Jerusalem has always rejected his father. Well, Jesus would have loved for them to turn to him and accept him as their Messiah, to repent and believe the good news that the kingdom of God is near, that their salvation from the wrath of God is at hand. It was not to be. Well, Jesus would have loved for the city to recognise in him God was visiting them with an olive branch. They would not realise it. They were blind. While peace between God and his people were offered, was offered, God's people continually chose rebellion and in doing so, the inescapable consequences of that choice. Coming. Perhaps Jesus is visiting now. Jesus weeps because he is ultimately concerned for Jerusalem's eternal well-being. Even on that day, when the religious leaders asked for the praise of Jesus as Messiah to cease, they failed to see this or recognise the sign of the times and see who is coming to them. In fact, even inanimate objects, even rocks, see better than they. And if they see better, their blindness is most severe. If they had known, Jesus says, if they had only known what would bring them peace, then they might have escaped. If they had known that the gospel which was pre preached in their streets was the power of God for peace and salvation for them, if, they, if only they had taken notice of God's words to them, they might have secured their own eternal well-being and welfare. If they, the beloved of God, had only known, if they had only understood God's word to them, if they had only humbled themselves and learned from his discipline, if they had only shed tears for their plight and rested on God's rich mercy and incomparable grace, then Jesus might not have occasion to weep over them, but rather have a reason to rejoice and be glad over them as one who found a lost coin or a lost sheep. No, the real tragedy for Jesus is not his impending death or the wickedness and injustice that would precede it. It is that Jerusalem is blind. Not only can't Jerusalem see, but even if they could, the truth would be hidden from it. Just as Pharaoh, in that story that birthed a nation recorded for us in Exodus, chapters 5 to 12, began with a hard heart. He further hardened it towards God. Even though softening his heart and bowing under the hand of God would have been for his salvation and his deliverance, in the end, it is not Pharaoh who hounds his heart, but God who makes it like flint so that his glory and salvation might be displayed to everyone and everything. Because Jerusalem, or the Jewish nation she represents, rejects God's salvation brought by judges, prophets, priests and kings, and now even by God's own Son, the Messiah, because she does not recognise the time of God's coming. Either before, but especially now, as Jesus fulfils every prophecy concerning the Messiah, she cannot escape the inevitable consequence that will irretrievably follow. Nevertheless, there will be some who see, will there not? There will be some who recognise God's visitation for their salvation in Christ Jesus, and they, they will become his church. But despite that, there is no escaping the consequences of their desires. In about 40 years, in AD 70, the city will be demolished, with only a few bits of walls and pieces of tower left standing. 
the event will be horrific. You think, you look at the news today and you see the pictures of, of war happening in Ukraine and you think those pictures are horrific. They are horrible. How would they, they, they would bomb a place where they know people are. Compared to this, compared to what happens in Jerusalem, that is G-rated. There's no man, no woman, no child, no infant that will escape. This, uh, this event, the victors are merciless. Merci only, the only ones who will survive are the strong who they'll take to Rome to use as sport, gladiators. Horrific. There is a truth here for us. Each of us. To miss the day of God's salvation or to ignore it or to harden your heart to it is to choose a faith that once set is inescapable. There will come a time set by the Father when Jesus will judge the whole world according to the Gospel. And that includes you and I. That includes our, our families, our neighbours, our friends, our enemies. If Jerusalem, whom God loved as a child, would not escape the inevitable consequence of rejecting God, how much less could ones like you and I escape, who this day would refuse to heed the day or time God has visited upon them. We cannot refuse the free gift of life that comes through faith in Jesus' death and resurrection. We cannot refuse the offer of salvation from the wrath of God and the miracle that would make us one of his children. We cannot escape that. This is an important word for us. There are four things I want to leave you with today. You need to write them down because I couldn't be bothered putting them in the PowerPoint. <laughs> Which you'd have to write down anyway, wouldn't you? If you want to take them with you. Four things. There are things we need to know, number one. Things we need to know in practical terms that make for our peace. Those things include how that peace is gained, the terms upon which God grants that peace, the eternal and temporal benefits of peace with God, and how that peace is maintained. And these are the things we've got to apply. We can't just have them as words on a page. We need to apply them in our life. Most notably, the application of these things is the ongoing work of the Gospel, the good news about Jesus. Only through continuing to trust in the Gospel of God's grace are we saved. And through continuing to trust and apply that same grace, are we kept in the peace that God provides? It's not as if we trust God's grace, the gospel, for our salvation and then think we have to work really hard to stay there. It's not that we have to do better and better and better. That if we don't do better and better and better, God will be angry with us. It's not that at all. Our perseverance in that peace that comes through our trust in the gospel is always dependent on our ongoing rest in God's grace. Always. It's His grace which teaches us to say no to ungodliness. It is God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Not anything else. And you know, we might have been walking with Jesus for 20 years, but if, if we don't do that now, what's it, what's it about? If that doesn't excite us in our hearts now, then do we care about the holiness of our life? Do we care about the sin which so easily seems to capture us? Do we care about, about what that says about our God, about our, our Christ? Do we care about the fact that that's the reflection of him which we're presenting to the world around us? 
If we're bored by this, what will it suffer? bored by this, what will grasp our heart? Number two. There is a time when God comes to us, when his peace that comes through his grace and power can be known. We recognise it when we experience the work of the Holy Spirit that comes alive in us through the word of God the worship of God or a word from God. That work is often in an awakened conscience, a, a renewed sense of our need for Jesus and his holiness in the place of our wretchedness and our sin, or a, a renewed sense of the identity of Jesus, who we are, who we are now because of our identity in his history. We have been crucified with Christ, yeah? This visitation is not so that we can simply bask in sunshine, but so we might become more like Jesus, stripping off the old self, being clothed with his righteousness. Number three, just because you've been in church for a long time, been exposed to the preaching of God's word, participated in the Lord's Supper, or even experienced heartfelt worship, having those things on the outside do not mean that you have responded to God when he has come to you through those means. Just by being here doesn't change your heart. Doesn't mean you've responded to the times God has visited you. It is pure folly to believe that just by being in the presence of those things, you have recognised God coming to you. There will be some who have been in this church, even at this time, who will say they have never heard the gospel clearly proclaimed or even explained to them. But what has really happened is they have not recognised the time that God has visited them. That's why we pray at every worship service that God's Spirit will be active that people's eyes will be open. Because without the action of God, we cannot recognise Jesus coming to us. Or is Jesus wrong when he says to Nicodemus, that unless one is born of the Spirit, born from above, they cannot recognise the Kingdom of God. We pray today for that awakening in the hearts of people. When the lights come on, and they're no longer in darkness. And number four. But if we do, if we do sense the presence of God's Spirit, an awakening in our heart, a heart that is not in our chest, but that is in our guts, yeah? If we do recognise that, we must respond to that. We cannot just sit here and wait until just goes away like indigestion. We must not harden our heart. We must not ignore nor hide our eyes or block our ears. For none are so blind as those who having eyes refuse to see. None are so deaf as those who having ears refuse to, to listen. Jesus comes to make us holy. To make us like him. To make us his own. And you know, he might have to come. And he might have to upturn a few tables in our heart to do that. He might have to demolish some cages of animals. Just like he did when he entered the temple. He might have to put his finger in places in your life that you do not like that you wish he would not see. But he comes to do that, to make you like him, to save you. If you sense his spirit, do not be afraid. Listen to what God says to us through Paul's second letter 
to the Corinthians chapter 5 verses 20 to chapter 6 verse 2. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favour I heard you, and the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favour. Now is the day of salvation. And if this is for you, if this, if you are hearing God today, right now, for whatever reason, you need to come and respond to Him. Do not wait. Do not go home and let it be. Do not say, I'll do it after lunch. You need to respond today. You need to respond now. Even as the worship team comes to bless us again, come, come forward. Someone will pray for you, an elder, or someone in our leadership team will come and pray with you. But more importantly, the Holy Spirit will minister God's grace to you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray you save us from missing your visiting of us. Father, we are in so desperate need of him. We live in a world in which people are desperately lost. And Lord Jesus, apart from you, we have no man. Holy Spirit, come and work in our hearts and our minds.